For this lecture, we're going to begin looking a little bit at educational theory, just on a very basic level. So as we begin thinking about what is Christian education, and how should we teach the Bible, and how should we lead Bible studies, we want to think a little bit about how um, what some of the educational uh, theory is that underpins the way people think about teaching and learning. Now, uh, on this slide, what I just wanted to show you is there's, there's a, a, a spectrum of ways of thinking about um, what education is and how education should be done. And so it slides on the nature-nurture scale. Do we allow uh, young people to simply kind of explore their, uh, their interests? Uh, is education about removing the roadblocks that get in the way of young people just kind of beginning to explore the world on their own? That would be the nature side of things, and we'll, we'll see that. And then on the other side of things is nurture, to say no, that there are things that need to be done, discipline, practices, um, to help young people learn. Um, and so we'll see as we go through here, and you can see kind of there, there's some different, you know, other categories in the middle here, but this is just to try to give you a picture of the, the spectrum of wrestling with the nature-nurture question. And when we get into talking about Christian education, one of the things we'll explore is, is about faith. How does faith develop? And how do we think of faith in the context of, a, uh, of education and teaching and, and, and learning? So as we think about this spectrum, we're going to kind of walk through some um, you know, different ways of thinking about education that would kind of fit into this. So one of the first uh, places to start is to think about uh, the philosopher Plato and his view of, of education. Now, you know, we have talked in the past about the forms and treeness and all that kind of stuff. And the important point that I, I want you to think about with Plato is that he would say that there's an objective truth about reality. So you think about the world, when we look out at the world, the world as we see it connects to these kind of higher forms or there's higher truth about reality. And so what education is, is about making sure that our, uh, we, we are connecting to those higher truths. Um, so education for Plato is an awakening of our memory. So for him, the forms are actually present with, within our memory. We've, we've forgotten. And so education is really this process of being reminded of, of having those things awakened so that our mind can connect to the higher truth about uh, reality so that there's a correspondence. Uh, and again, so for Plato, he would say that we need to love what is beautiful. And so as we think about the good and beauty and justice, these are, are things, uh, ideas that really exist and that our mind could correspond to. Uh, and so as we think about the world, as we know the world, there is that correspondence, but that has to be awakened within us. And this is what education uh, is doing. And in this view, there becomes an emphasis on certain forms of knowledge and certain forms of culture. There are higher ways of knowing. There's a way in which the world is and should be. Uh, and that the purpose of education is to pass this along. So we pass on this kind of cultural heritage that reflects the truth about the world. So when we talk about things like classical education, maybe you've heard of that. There's, there's a sense of reading the great books um, that represent the highest of learning and that uh, all people should be exposed to this and that this is what it means to become educated is to know and understand uh, the truth about reality in the world as it is passed down to us through, uh, through these uh, forms of, of knowing and, and the tradition. Now this is the allegory of the cave. I'm not going to go through this. We've talked about this before, but that becomes kind of a basis of kind of thinking, a way of thinking about the forms and, and education is taking us out of darkness and untruth and bringing us into the light of truth. Now, again, this is hard. So uh, people don't naturally want this. And so Plato would say there's a form of discipline that has to happen in education. So as we think about the spectrum, Plato is probably going to land um, more on the nurture side, that by nature, we don't want to come into the light. And so um, education is a disciplining that leads us uh, uh, in, into the light. 
And then as we think about uh, John Locke, um, it, it's a little bit of a move away from, from Plato, but there is a sense uh, in which we're still kind of dealing with the nurture side, where for Locke, the mind is a blank slate, the tabula rosa, uh, and the and experiences of the world leaves impressions. Uh, so it's through kind of the sensory experience that these impressions are made and that ideas are formed. Uh, he's against these kind of this kind of idea of innate ideas. So he's going to push back against Plato and, and Descartes. He, but he's also against total depravity. Uh, so he doesn't look at the human person as being negative. But we still are getting the nurture side because because of the blank slate model. There's a sense in which education is the process by which our ideas are formed. And so education is through discipline and rationality and through the cultivation of, uh, of habits. Education is natural human development. Here we have Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now we're over on the nature side. And, and here Rousseau would argue that the mind develops kind of through natural experience. And so he has a very biological view of the mind, almost an evolutionary view of the mind, that our, our, um, our mind unfolds, our mind develops as we move through different stages. Um, and that there are particular forms of knowledge that are appropriate for their, these kind of different uh, times of development. And so his argument is that education must conform to these different uh, processes of development or different times of development. Uh, and we support development then with proper exercises and experiences that kind of cultivate knowledge. But it's also important to, to know that for Rousseau, there's a sense in which we need to, re education is about removing the roadblocks. So allowing each stage of development, allowing the child the, the opportunity to engage in these experiences that are going to allow the development of the mind. And so education becomes much more about appropriate um, subject matter for different you know, age periods, but then also kind of removing the roadblocks uh, for natural development. And Rousseau would talk about four stages of development. The first is physical, so the emphasis is on direct experience, so zero to five. We're just engaging the world, and through that, the mind is beginning to develop. Um, what he refers to, so it's in quotes, the savage stage uh, from five to 12, where, again, it, it says exploration, do nothing. What it's saying is we need to take away the inhibitions and, and the, the roadblocks, and so education is about giving the, the young child this opportunity to just simply kind of explore the world. And in exploring the world, you're, the mind is going to develop naturally. Um, and then at 12 to 15, this becomes a stage of rationality where the focus becomes science and, and kind of utility, practicality. And then um, 15 to 20 is where uh, the social side comes in, and we begin thinking about theology and, and society and thinking about the self. And again, so for Rousseau, there's a romantic understanding of the child, that the child will develop. If left to itself within its natural state, the child will develop um, appropriately, and the mind will develop. And so this is really education by subtraction, especially in the beginning. We're taking away those roadblocks. We're allowing the child to just simply kind of follow its, its, its uh, biology in, in, in developing. Uh, there's an emphasis on the goodness of the child, and as I've said, we kind of get the barriers out of the way. So you can see how this is very much on the nature side, that we just need to, education is about creating structures that uh, free the child to be able to, to develop uh, in appropriate ways. Uh, education and socializations, this is Horace, Horace Mann, uh, as we think especially about the development of public education in the United States, um, this is a big part of it. Uh, how do you create an American culture out of all of these separate cultures? So education uh, becomes a form of socialization where your purpose isn't just to give knowledge, but it's to incorporate young people into a particular society, and you're encoding them with values um, through education, you're providing social norms, you're upholding social norms, and you're really then equipping young people to take their place in society. So again, Horace Mann, there was an emphasis on how do we maintain democracy? How do we prepare workers for a capitalist system? Uh, and how do we create a socially coherent you know, group 
out of all of these different people who are coming to the United States. Um, now, it, it, there I say absence of religion is, is necessary for this because religion beca became this um, kind of d dividing block in there. Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, Jewish, Muslim, right? And so how then do you create an American culture? Religion becomes divisive. So the focus becomes a form of public education that socializes and encodes particular values, liberal democracy, uh, uh, work, uh, and, and a capitalist system. And so education becomes grounded uh, as a form of, of socialization. And then you have John Dewey and the emphasis on education as, as cultural development. Um, and for Dewey, there's really a focus on kind of the scientific and technological development, that the purpose of education is to meet basic needs and to, to help solve and address current problems. And so the edu for edu education for Dewey becomes very much about problem solving um, and, and helping cultivate young people who are able to solve the, the issues of their day. And so education becomes this tool about solving kind of the, the practical issues. Um, the focus for Dewey was really on cultivating natural curiosities. Here you get teacher as guide, not expert. Um, you know, not sage on the stage, but the guide on the side type of thing. Uh, and so the focus of the teacher is to just simply uh, facilitate these different problems uh, and so on that, that young people would then begin to solve. And, and again... Uh, for Dewey, there's not so much this kind of platonic or, or emphasis upon this tradition or this great tradition or deposit, because really education is about meeting the cultural needs. It's not to say that you know literature and history and those things aren't important. They're important in as much as they help uh, shape young people who are going to be able to begin to engage this, the social needs uh, of the day. Uh, and, and I have that line, there's truth changes as social needs change. So the, the truth that education is dealing with is how do we address the particular problems facing a particular culture? And then you have Piaget, and Piaget really wasn't, you know, a, uh, uh, an educational theorist. You know, he's a behavioral psychologist, but uh, he emphasized some things that I think are important because for him, he would say that children are not empty vessels or blank slates. He called them little scientists that are kind of making making sense of the world. And for him, the mind kind of develops as young people begin, as children, as babies, as infants, really begin to engage uh, the world. Um, and again, as the mind uh, matures. Uh, and so you get these different stages. Zero to two is sensory motor. Two to seven is pre-operational. Seven through uh, 11 is concrete operational. 11 to 20 is formal operational. So you move from a kind of concrete engagement of the world and as the mind then begins to develop to a much more abstract engagement of the world. So you have a movement from kind of concrete engagement and education to abstraction. Uh, but for Piaget, the, the, the child constructs meaning of the world from the very beginning and really the mind develops through a process of equilibrium, disequilibrium, that as a child encounters the world, you know, something d doesn't make sense. There's a disequilibrium in the equilibrium, and the point is for the child to kind of make it right. And so there's this mind, the mind develops as the child is engaging, um, in, in engaging the world. And, and again, the teacher here becomes a facilitator in a sense of putting problems in front of the child that allows that um, process to, to actually begin. And I put at the bottom there, this kind of inside out development of the mind that as we think about, you know, the, the engagement of the world leads to a process by which that the mind develops. Uh, so, you know, the cultural world around is, is important, but, but really it is that, uh, that unfolding of the mind as the child engages, um, engages the world, uh, that allows for, uh, education or learning or growth. And again, so an education system in this context is going to be about setting problems before the child and recognizing um, those different stages of development and, and that the problems um, that are appropriate for each of these, these different stages. So, you know, a lot of times you might hear somebody say, well, uh, you know, 
at this age, they're much more concrete thinkers. And so the abstract thought comes much later. And, and we'll raise questions about this and ask, is that right? Um, in, in kind of future lectures as we engage kind of Karen Egan. Um, but so this is Piaget, and, and Piaget has been influential uh, in the way in which uh, people think about education, in the, in the way people think about learning. So the question for us is, what does this mean for education? Um, what does this mean for the way that we think about education, and what does this mean then for the way we think about Christian education? Because as we think about Christian education, oftentimes it kind of follows educational models. Uh, and it's important for us to then kind of, kind of think about that. Uh, and as we've gone through these different very basic ideas of educational theory, I'm sure that many of you are, are kind of thinking, well, yeah, that makes sense, or that makes sense, or maybe you have a vision of what education should be, and you never really understood where that came from, but it, it, it may have, you know, be, gr be grounded in the, the theory that we've, we've just kind of gone through. And so what we have to think about is, what does teaching and learning look like in the church, in the church community? What does faith formation look like? How do we make sense of these different educational theories uh, for school? And then what does it look like to bring that into uh, the church as a way of catechesis, as a way of faith development? Um, what does it mean for your youth groups that you teach? Uh, how, how might they be helpful or not be helpful? Um, and are there other ways of thinking about teaching and learning and formation and catechesis that can help us um, kind of think through faith development? So that's where we're headed with this, but this lecture was primarily focused on giving a little bit of an introduction to some, some educational theory. We'll come back to this when we talk about Egan, because Egan is going to return to these ideas, and he's actually going to suggest uh, a different way forward. But for now, it's just important for us to kind of think about that spectrum of, of teaching and learning on the nature uh, and nurture continuum.